All right. So now we have uh, Marcus Model. I wanted to make sure I got that right. Uh, and he's going to be talking about algorithmic uh, differentiation in OCaml. Take it away. Um, so yeah, yeah, round of applause. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Ryan. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, uh, let me present this project. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I guess um, people who have worked with OCaml have already seen my name somewhere. I've been active in the community for about 17 years. <laughs> And um, I've uh, worked uh, also some time in, on Wall Street and uh, uh, before that in uh, machine learning research. And um, the last uh, uh, few years I've um, um, spent some time trying to come up with uh, better ways to do machine learning. And um, this project I hope will help with that. So what is algorithmic differentiation? Um, it is basically about turning something like this into something like that. So, so what, what are we actually uh, uh, talking about here? Uh, can you guys at the very uh, back see, still read the code, or should I make it a bit bigger? Bigger. bigger? bigger? Okay, yeah. Okay, that's probably better. So this is basically the implementation of a, a feed-forward neural network in OCaml. Um, there are no bells and whistles here. It's, it's really just bare bones. Uh, it should also not be seen as an endorsement of neural networks. I'm actually not so much into them, but most people uh, who have had some exposure to machine learning probably know about that. So it's a good example to uh, present what's going on here. Um, so let's assume you have a specification of some uh, feed-forward neural network and uh, a batch of uh, problems uh, or samples, you have inputs and outputs that you observed and you want to evaluate this uh, uh, neural network to see whether it performs well, what its error might be. Um, uh, that program will do it for you. It will ca calculate the sum of squared errors between the observed outputs and between uh, the outputs that uh, the neural network will return on your inputs. And the neural network will just uh, fold over a couple of layers, uh, uh, weighing uh, inputs from previous layers with uh, uh, some weight matrix and uh, uh, transforming them in between with some nonlinear functions. So it's, it's, it's very a simple uh, 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 implementation. And what we want to do is just derive something like that from this. And what is that? So this down here is a, a implicitly parallelized. Uh, uh, backpropagation network. Uh, so we, the goal is uh, to derive uh, something that's considerably more efficient in terms of learning uh, purely from code. So that's what's, uh, what algorithmic differentiation is about. Um, if you want to see a little bit more uh, closer up uh, what this uh, network is doing, so this is a, a graphical visualization of the computational graph. Uh, this is just evaluation of, uh, uh, of the network itself. So you see here so the weight matrix and the input matrix coming in, uh, so matrix multiplication, nonlinear function, etc., until you arrive at the result. And uh, you can, this is, for example, a transformation to parallelize this. So you, instead of performing uh, matrix multiplication on one big matrix, uh, you might uh, uh, to in-place operations, that's these red colors, uh, on sub-matrices. And uh, uh, in, a, in the next step, uh, that would be this graph, which is much, much bigger and very complicated and pretty much undoable for a human. Uh, that's a parallelized version of uh, backpropagation. Uh, so we can calculate the gradients uh, of the network parameters, uh, which would be extremely useful for optimization. <clears throat> so let's get back to the slides. So what is AD? It's, it's a mathematically exact and efficient method for differentiable computational models. Um, so uh, I put it in blue here. So uh, mathematically exact and efficient, that's obviously something good. 
Interestingly, a lot of um, people in the industry still work with uh, methods that are neither mathematically exact nor efficient. <laughs> <laughs> no, the opposite, that's what's something new to people here. Um, and well, the downside is uh, with that approach, obviously you need something uh, that is differentiable. So if there are some mathematical constraints on uh, what uh, kind of programs you can apply that to. So the goal is to take the OCaml implementation of an almost arbitrary differentiable function and be able to calculate parameter sensitivities. So what would happen if you wiggle one of the input parameters, how much would uh, some output change? And you could use that, for example, to also optimize models uh, to find uh, parameter settings that optimize uh, some uh, cost function, likelihood function, whatever. And so obviously, this is a, it's very broadly applicable to all kinds of areas like climate modeling. Uh, maybe you want to find out how much the uh, global mean temperature would change if you uh, increase uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, you can price financial contracts uh, with that uh, to or determine risk uh, to find out how sensitive some uh, uh, financial instrument is to changes in other uh, in, in certain prices. Um, and for me personally, uh, the main motivation was actually from machine learning research. Um, I, I just found it extremely difficult to implement uh, uh, many of the modern machine learning uh, techniques manually. Uh, uh, if you look at pa uh, papers in machine learning research, often you, fight, so find, uh, you would find several pages of uh, derivations, how to calculate the derivatives for some expression. And sometimes you are not even correct, and sometimes it's just really hard to implement uh, correctly. Uh, and I just wanted to automate such process. Uh, so uh, to taking the example I presented here, um, feed uh, forward neural networks plus something that's called reverse mode, so algorithmic differentiation gives you backpropagation. So this famous backpropagation algorithm in uh, neural network uh, research is actually just a spe special case of something much more general. <clears throat> so to contrast uh, this to other techniques, uh, what is algorithmic differentiation not? Uh, so it's not symbolic differentiation. I'm pretty sure that most of you uh, functional programmers have at some point or another written down some term structure with multiplication and plus, minus, etc., and maybe written a transformation from uh, such a symbolic expression to its derivative. Uh, this is actually not what's going on. Um, the problem is if you just rewrite terms in a more naive way that way, you will, would end up with enormously complicated symbolic expressions. Uh, whereas in algorithmic differentiation, you don't use symbolic expressions at all, uh, generally. Uh, it works directly with numbers, so it's a numeric technique, uh, but it's still mathematically exact. Uh, that said, it is still possible to also apply symbolic optimizations. Um, for some techniques, for example, you might uh, generate uh, the compute, uh, computational graph of a, uh, uh, of a, a program, and it is possible to optimize it by rewriting certain things or improve numerical stability. Uh, but it's, it's not strictly necessary to achieve good performance and uh, mathematically exact outcomes. Um, a technique that um, still a lot of people in the industry use to determine sensitivities of uh, computational models of, uh, uh, in, in all kinds of areas is uh, so-called bumping, so numer numerical differentiation. I'm pretty sure many of you also have uh, tried that uh, at some point or another if you wrote numeric code. Um, in that case, you just add a small number to one of the inputs, uh, calculate the result, and subtract uh, the result you would get without this little change. And that way you can find out the gradients uh, 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 of, of that function. Well, the problem, of course, is this is just an approximation. And uh, if you pick epsilon too, if, uh, too small, uh, you might run into problems with numerical uh, with, with rounding errors, so you might come up with completely nonsensical results. And if you pick epsilon too big, obviously it's a bad approximation for that point. So obviously you want to avoid that. And another big problem is it's obviously slow. Uh, what if you have a million parameters for your model? Uh, you'd have to evaluate that function millions of times to get uh, accurate, uh, no, not even accurate, uh, um, uh, estimates for the derivative. So how, how, does, uh, how do I solve that problem? Um, let's assume you want to uh, calculate the derivative of a very simple function. Uh, 
f of x equals the square of the sine of x, and it's evaluated at 0.3. Um, I augmented this example already uh, with um, uh, some uh, extra definitions. Uh, so the first thing I did is I uh, made it a little bit more explicit that we are dealing with an algebra. So in that case, we have an algebra over floats. That could also be vectors, matrices, tensors, whatever you want. Uh, there are many kinds of objects you might be able to calculate derivatives for. And uh, there are certain operators we can use to transform these objects. Uh, and um, by uh, using uh, a functor, um, which uh, is basically a way of mapping one program module to another, um, you can factor out this uh, or abstract away uh, this dependency on a particular algebra. So here, down here, I instantiate this example with a standard algebra, which I haven't shown here. So obviously, so the standard algebra uh, uh, in, in the standard algebra of loads of loads, uh, the sine functions, the sine function, etc. Uh, and we are now going to replace that uh, to, um, uh, to to show you how a simple way of doing algorithmic differentiation. Uh, that's the so-called forward mode of algorithmic uh, differentiation. And like all uh, algorithmic differentiation techniques, it basically just builds on the chain rule of calculus. So if you have a, uh, an input parameter x, and you calculate some parameter y from that, and finally return a value z, the chain rule just tells you how to uh, uh, calculate the derivative for that expression. And uh, in, uh, in this example here, I've changed the standard algebra or augmented it with some extra information, with some extra accounting or bookkeeping information uh, that allows me to calculate this um, derivative exactly. Um, so this float now is not just a single float. I actually have two float values here. The first one stands for uh, the usual value you would expect, and the second one corresponds to the derivative. Uh, so for example, if you want to uh, implement uh, uh, the sine function in that algebra. Uh, obviously, the first value just becomes the sine value in uh, the standard algebra, possibly. Uh, and the derivative is just the cosine of that value times the derivative of, uh, of that input value. So this is just uh, one step of that, uh, in, 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 that, uh, uh, in that application of the chain rule here. Um, so if you instantiate the example with, that, with a dual algebra that performs this calculation uh, and then just set the, the first value to, to the input value and uh, d to 1, uh, d just corresponds to dx over dx, so obviously x uh, uh, derived, uh, the, uh, derived by x is just 1. Uh, if you do that, the resulting z will have the exact uh, derivative in uh, the value d. Uh, I've done actually a little bit more in that example already. Uh, I could have just defined uh, this over the standard algebra, but I made this a functor too, meaning you can parameterize these derivative rules over arbitrary algebras. Uh, one uh, nice thing you can do with that is, obviously you can apply uh, this uh, functor to itself, to, to, the, to, to the result of that uh, functor application itself. So you could, for example, call make dual on the standard algebra and make dual on the result again because both the input and the output of the functor are algebras. Uh, what would be the result of that? Well, you can basically calculate higher derivatives that way. Um, so here's a, uh, an example of a computational graph for the pro uh, uh, problem of uh, 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 si uh, the sine of x squared. Uh, you get the input. Um, uh, here we calculate the sine and get the result. And uh, here we perform this, uh, uh, the multiplication of the uh, input's uh, derivative uh, times uh, the derivative uh, times the cosine of x uh, to, to uh, obtain the uh, uh, derivative. Um, now, what's, what's the, what are the pros and cons of using this obviously very simple approach? Well, it's easy to implement and has low bookkeeping effort. You don't have to keep track of much, just basically twice the amount of uh, numbers. Uh, and it's also very efficient if you have an, a lot of outputs. Uh, if, if you have just one input in your program 
and you have a thousand outputs, you just run the calculation once and you obtain the sensitivities of all the output values in one go. Uh, now the, con the downside is, uh, this is actually not a problem that people typically have. Uh, most people have a lot of inputs and just one output. Uh, the out this one output usually corresponding to some uh, kind of um, uh, 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 cost function maybe that you want to optimize. And uh, another problem is that these uh, dual numbers also scale, scale badly uh, to higher derivatives, especially if those are sparse. Um, uh, so this makes uh, the forward mode approach not very useful in practice, uh, but uh, there's another way to do it. And uh, the more interesting way and much more difficult way is uh, so-called reverse mode algorithmic differentiation. It's also built on the chain rule exactly as uh, the previous example. But this time, we don't start from the right to the left, we go from the left to the right. And uh, the implication of that is, instead of going with the program flow, uh, just uh, calculating the D while going uh, forward in the ex execution of the program, we now basically have to run our program backwards. So first you run it forwards, uh, storing all the intermediate operations and values that you observed. And so once you have that, res uh, that trace, you run this program backwards, substituting all these operations you did uh, with so-called reverse mode rules that update uh, um, so-called adjoint values. And these adjoint values, uh, at, once you reach the very top, the input parameters correspond to the derivatives. Um, I haven't provided you with an example of how to implement this because obviously that's very, very much more difficult to achieve. Um, so I'll just explain it mathematically uh, for a moment. Uh, so first we have here the definition of uh, what, the what an adjoint is. The adjoint of V, that's just a derivative of the expression containing this value uh, with respect to that value. So if the total expression is Z, the adjoint of Z is DZ over DZ, so that's obviously one. Yeah? The whole expression varies uh, with itself uh, uh, perfectly, obviously. Uh, and then we just go back within the chain rule and then we apply the x squared rule. Uh, obviously, if the derivative of x squared is 2x, uh, so we take, take this uh, y for the intermediate value, and we just need to multiply it with the adjoint value to obtain the next adjoint. And uh, that way, if you get uh, the derivative of the total expression with respect to y and then 2x, etc. Uh, so that's a very efficient way of obtaining all the um, uh, der derivatives for every input. Uh, variable. Now I cheated just a little bit here. So it's even more complicated. Uh, so that was a previous uh, slide. On this one uh, I added a plus equals. Uh, why do I need that? Uh, so the problem is um, in forward mode in the other one, if you go forward, every value is produced by exactly one operation. But if you go backward, there may be many operations that actually use your value. That may, may be used in many different branches of your program. And the, that means that uh, the information from all these branches have to flow together in these adjoint values. So that's why you actually have to update uh, these adjoints in a sort of um, imperative way. It's actually very important. Uh, you'll see later. Um, so here's a computational graph of the reverse mode example. So obviously it will end up with the exact same uh, derivative. So what are the pros and cons of reverse mode? Uh, it is kind of dual to the uh, uh, forward mode, uh, but this time um, we have the advantage it is super efficient for large numbers of inputs. So you could have millions of inputs and uh, the reverse mode will give you all of them, uh, give, you, give you derivatives for all of them, uh, taking just a constant fact of time longer. So usually that factor is somewhere between two and 10-ish, I would say. And that is a, a, a very substantial speed up. Uh, uh, just compare this to having to uh, evaluate the function a million times versus, versus just once when it takes 10 times longer. So you may be 100,000 times faster. Uh, the, one of the cons is obviously uh, you have a much higher bookkeeping effort. So memory consumption is dramatically higher. Uh, that can be a problem for uh, some practical applications. Uh, there are ways around it. So I won't go too much into that yet. 
Uh, but uh, having to store this trace of what happened before or what the, what the program did also has some other advantages. Obviously, you have the compute, complete computational graph, so you can do some graph revi re rewriting too uh, if, if you are already at it. Uh, you can also, for example, visualize that graph, which is uh, what I did here. Um, one very nice feature is you can reuse allocated values. Let's assume you have allocated huge matrices and vectors. They are all still around, which means uh, if you uh, calculate the results of the function and then you go back uh, to cal calculate the derivatives, you can also go forward again reusing all these values. So you never have to allocate anything twice. Uh, basically, if that is well implemented, you can do almost everything just with in-place operations that uh, may happen in uh, 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 BLAS and LAPAC, so in highly optimized uh, numerical libraries. Uh, and there are actually examples where re-evaluating the trace is faster than if you just ran the plain vanilla program uh, due to that. Um, yeah, and obviously the, um, the big downside is very much more difficult to implement, especially if you want to have things like extensibility, if you want to be able to add new types or operators to this algebra. Um, Let's get to some general limitations for algorithmic differentiation. It would be really nice if you could just uh, apply uh, algorithmic differentiation and, uh, to, to your program and expect exact uh, correct results. That may be the case, but uh, sometimes uh, uh, the program is written in a way that doesn't quite allow that. So here's an example of what might happen. Uh, here we are essentially breaking the chain rule uh, and we are doing this, uh, so, so we have just an if statement, and those are allowed in general, but this if statement actually looks at a value for which you want to calculate a derivative. Uh, it, it's almost like in quantum mechanics, the moment you look at the, val uh, at the value of that variable to determine what to do next, in that moment you break the chain rule, uh, usually. Uh, for example, if x is equal to 3, then we return a constant. Uh, what's the derivative of a constant? What's well, 0? So it's, uh, we would return zero here, but if you look at the other branch, it says x times x. Uh, now three squared is, uh, 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 is also, uh, 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 x times x, even uh, x equals three is nine. So basically this function is just computing x squared, and the derivative of x squared is certainly not zero if, uh, 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 for, for x equals three. So we are get, getting a wrong result here. Um, so how can we prevent this? Uh, the simple solution is just never let your, the uh, execution of your program de uh, depend on what the actual values of the variables are. Uh, it is okay to look, for example, at an unrelated constant for which you don't calculate derivatives and so which doesn't change between different runs of the function. Uh, it would still ca uh, calculate correct results, but uh, that's not the case for uh, variables that's, uh, for which you require derivatives. Um, so users should generally just see conditional statements as configuring a computational graph. So once this, once this particular branch is taken uh, and uh, uh, that part of the branch determines what the final computational graph is going to look like, and this graph is static, so it doesn't really change anymore. Uh, one way around this problem is also uh, using extensible algebras and so called structured algorithmic differentiation. Um, if you look at... Uh, complicated numerical software, for example, matrix mul multiplication algorithms, they often employ such tests, for example, to improve numerical stability. They might uh, determine the uh, largest uh, pivots uh, to use in some uh, pivoting uh, algorithm. And um, uh, this would destroy uh, algorithmic differentiation. Um, but if you know what the mathematical properties of uh, such a an implementation are, for example, okay, it's matrix multiplication or factorization, whatever, uh, then you can implement the correct rules outside of, uh, um, uh, of, of the code, uh, just using exploiting those uh, mathematical properties. It's usually not very difficult, so you don't have to write all that code again. Uh, you just may uh, have to apply it a little differently. And uh, that way you can achieve very good performance. So everything will still run in LAPAC and uh, uh, BLAS uh, and other numerical libraries, um, but uh, uh, you won't have to, uh, you won't run into problems with uh, breaking the chain uh, in that case. 
Uh, another limitation is obviously some functions are not differentiable and, uh, everywhere. Uh, for example, taking the absolute value of uh, 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 a float uh, at the point zero, the derivative is not uh, fully defined. So in that particular case, for example, you could take directional derivatives. If you know what direction you want to go, uh, the positive or the negative direction, then in that case, the derivative is well defined. And forward mode differentiation would in that case also give the correct result. Um, another thing you can do is you can smooth out kinks in the function. If uh, you run into uh, uh, that, uh, you can maybe replace uh, or add a new operator to the algebra uh, that allows you to uh, get very close to the behavior of that function and maybe even obtain sensitivity results with respect to how exactly or how, how round you make the kink. Uh, you could also raise exceptions, of course, if uh, the system determines that uh, some value is too close to singularity and uh, to, to warn the user that uh, results are not dependable. Um, yeah, so let's, let's get to uh, the implementation of uh, uh, Camel, and uh, before that I'll just quickly explain some or describe some other frameworks. I'm pretty sure uh, many of you have heard, for example, about TensorFlow, which uh, Google uh, recently released. Uh, a lot of people use uh, Theano for um, uh, machine learning and uh, implementing deep learning techniques. Uh, so I've broadly classified these into algorithm-based and graph-based. Uh, that's my own terminology. Uh, the graph-based ones typically uh, require you to explicitly create nodes in a computational graph. So it's, it's very explicit, explicit that this is not a normal program, but uh, that you are generating a computational graph. Uh, whereas with algorithm-based ones, you are basically trying to infer the computational graph just by uh, watching the execution of that program. And so the algorithm-based approaches are uh, more general. Uh, especially if, uh, if well implemented, also because you can uh, nest applications of uh, derivative operators. So uh, what's the current state of uh, ad hoc HEMA? So it's, uh, it's still in late alpha. I haven't released it yet, but uh, uh, all the features that I'm going to uh, mention uh, soon uh, are already implemented and work well. So I'm still trying to uh, smooth out some rough edges, usability issues, uh, add more uh, operators that people might uh, need. Uh, and the main problem with the project is right now just the sheer size of it. So, uh, uh, as I've mentioned in the introduction, uh, if you factorize out these algebras, you have to provide alternative implementations. And there are actually quite a lot of these different algebras in the system. You know, there may be one for parallelizing it, another one for doing reverse mode calculations, forward modes, uh, for rendering graphs, etc. So this is quite a lot of work because uh, there are so many operators to, to uh, implement. Um, uh, some of those operators may be very easy to implement, but others might uh, require several pages of, uh, of code. And uh, some are also extremely challenging to implement. So there's a lot of parallelism functionality in the framework. Uh, and um, uh, that is probably the part that was the most difficult. Uh, so I can certainly say that uh, mixing side effects and aliasing of values and parallelism, extensibility and so on, it's, it's very difficult to get under one hood. Uh, so what's, what are some major design decisions with uh, ad hoc camel that I wanted to achieve? Uh, it should be possible to, um, you, uh, to use so-called mixed nested modes with it. Uh, I wanted to be able to uh, uh, calculate the derivatives of programs that themselves use the derivative operator. Uh, and uh, this approach with factoring out algebras makes this extremely easy. You just pass along the algebra you're using to uh, other operators and uh, uh, that way it's guaranteed uh, that uh, you'll uh, obtain consistent results. Um, so here, here's an example. Uh, you have uh, uh, the standard algebra and you can make a dual algebra and you apply it again. Uh, so this is already, already a, 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 a nested mode, not, not mixed in this case, but uh, uh, there's not really uh, any limitation here. Uh, another design go goal was extensibility. Uh, that's actually one of those things that interestingly almost no framework supports, seems to support well. Uh, so let's say you have a missing operator. You really not like, uh, need the uh, vector uh, function for the hyperbolic arc cosine, whatever. Uh, how do you add this? Uh, well, you obviously could modify the source, but 
uh, and maybe some uh, that might be a good thing to do for that particular vector function. But what, for example, if you uh, want to introduce new types and operators for GPU support, support? Maybe you have some matrix object that actually happens to be on a GPU, and you have operators that can very efficiently modify that matrix. Uh, it is probably not a good idea to add all kinds of GPU support or other devices like network nodes or whatever else you use for uh, 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 algorithmic differentiation. Um, uh, uh, putting that all into just one framework is just overkill. Um, another thing you could do with uh, extensibility is so-called checkpointing approaches with algorithmic differentiation. Uh, as I've mentioned previously, uh, uh, memory consumption can be a huge problem with reverse modes for certain applications. And if you are able to add new operators uh, to uh, the framework on the fly with little effort, you could potentially factor out subgraphs from a computational graph. Uh, and uh, that way uh, reduce the amount of uh, instructions and uh, values that you have to store. Uh, and because you can nest operators and extend the algebra, uh, this becomes very easy because you don't have to hand implement the, uh, the derivatives again. You just apply the framework to itself on some level uh, to uh, uh, add these uh, specialized operators for you. Um, uh, another difference is um, I, descri I described uh, the dual number approach to uh, forward mode algorithmic differentiation. Uh, it's, it's a very simple and easy way to do it, uh, a more uh, but a more interesting way is um, uh, so-called uh, univariate Taylor polynomials. Uh, instead of just keeping one derivative value uh, uh, that uh, uh, you pass along, uh, you pass along uh, essentially a Taylor expansion uh, that uh, describes the uh, behavior of that function in a particular direction. Uh, so even if you have many uh, variables, uh, uh, you can say something like, uh, I want to pass along the derivative in that direction and uh, the derivative in uh, uh, that direction and maybe up to derivative uh, of eighth degree. Uh, and that way uh, you can, um, uh, for example, approximate or even exactly calculate uh, higher derivatives, for example, sparse derivative tensors. Uh, for example, if you have a uh, um, uh, if you have two input parameters and uh, look at the graph of the function, which might be some sort of hill-like landscape, uh, if you happen to be in a valley uh, that has a, a gentle uh, downward slope, uh, but uh, no curvature in that direction, you wouldn't need to pass along uh, um, a parameter that uh, calculates the derivatives or curvature in that direction. Uh, so you just uh, use one that is uh, orthogonal to it because you already know that maybe the coverage in a particular direction is zero, so you don't need to uh, be able to uh, calculate this. <clears throat> uh, also a major design decision was support for vector and matrix operations. Um, that can very dramatically improve, especially memory efficiency, both oh, and also computation time, but the former matters much more. Um, let's assume you want to multiply two, two big matrices, a uh, thousand by a thousand matrices. Uh, the computational complexity of that is uh, a cubic, so you would be talking about in the billions of instructions. If I were to apply reverse modes to that kind of problem, I would have to store billions of instructions and uh, associated values, which would obviously uh, cost at least in the tens of gigabytes of memory. Uh, so just performing this one matrix multiplication is pretty much infeasible for a lot of people, and it would also run dog slow. Um, uh, the reason is you would have to get every single value that you modified from your computation trace uh, to, cal to calculate uh, the adjoint values in reverse mode. And uh, this cannot possibly be as fast as uh, running something in uh, LAPAC or uh, basic linear algebra subroutines. Uh, if, but uh, the nice thing is the matrix itself is a function. It's a linear uh, representation of a linear function. So instead of having to store the trace of that whole matrix multiplication, you just store the matrix. And if you do that, um, um, a thousand by thousand matrix just costs in the tens of megabytes. Uh, and uh, this is uh, perfectly feasible. And uh, another advantage is uh, 
uh, because you don't have to read uh, values from the uh, computation trace, you can actually just execute this in LAPAC or, or BLAS again, uh, which will likely run I don't know, hundreds of times faster than if you uh, implement or calculate it um, or apply the algorithmic differentiation to matrix multiplication yourself. Uh, another important design decision, uh, support for derivatives of imperative operations. Uh, I guess for many people that sounds awkward, hey, uh, imperative operations, they have derivatives. Yeah, actually, you can calculate derivatives for those. Um, uh, that might be something, of, uh, something as simple as assigning values uh, to locations in vectors, or something more complicated like copying the, the first uh, 42 elements, starting at offset 3 for vector x, to offset 12 uh, it's in vector y uh, in two increments. Um, so the system supports that too. You can uh, construct uh, very complicated matrices and vectors uh, with these uh, operations and still obtain reliable derivatives. Um, and the reason why this is also so important is, uh, as I've mentioned when I described um, uh, the reverse mode rules, they have a sort of imperative flavor. Uh, so for example, if you want to copy the first 42 elements of a vector, uh, this is, it's a purely functional operation. You're just reading here and uh, obtain a, uh, a final result from that. Uh, how do you calculate the adjoint value for this vector? You know, so the adjoint always has the exact same shape or type as uh, uh, the, uh, the function value. And um, uh, the problem is, if you have a vector that has a million elements, but you're just dealing with 42 of them, how do you update this uh, adjoint value? You, you have to write uh, 42 uh, vector elements to, uh, into that adjoint. So if you don't support um, uh, imperative operations, uh, what are you going to do? Uh, actually, I so saw one implementation uh, that I'm not going to name, uh, but they essentially just copy a million element vector just because you need to update a few uh, elements in there. So obviously that's not uh, feasible. And um, uh, I mean, you, you can do it, but then you lose other features like um, being able to uh, use nested applications of, uh, um, uh, of alg algorithmic differentiation because uh, 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 the imperative update that's obviously is available in the standard algebra, uh, if, uh, if it's not available in uh, the signatures that you define that for which you can calculate derivatives, uh, that's the last stop, so to speak. You cannot go any deeper than that. Uh, another thing that is tricky to get right, uh, uh, the system supports uh, aliasing or sharing of impure values. So if you have vectors, matrices, um, uh, obviously there are always ways to perform what you want to do, but not necessarily efficiently or in an elegant way. Uh, here's an example where I want to just scale the column of a matrix. Uh, if I didn't allow for sharing of or slices or subvectors of uh, uh, um, uh, of uh, other impure objects, uh, I would have to copy them out, uh, modify them, and add additional copy operators and then copy them back in. And it's just messy, inefficient. Uh, Whereas here, it's, it's just uh, uh, trivial. You just get the slice of that uh, uh, matrix and scale it by the certain factor. And um, the, even the parallelism framework will make sure that these uh, side effects are tracked correctly. So if you're writing to the matrix and to the vector at the same time, the system knows that these have to happen in the right order to uh, obtain correct results. Um, yeah, so another big point, uh, parallelism. Uh, the framework, uh, actually it's this, this part of the framework is independent from algorithmic differentiation. It could be used standalone. Uh, it parallelizes your program automatically, uh, implicit uh, parallelism. Um, for example, if you have some vector, uh, vec, uh, and you apply the sine function to all elements and uh, you will also want to calculate the cosine, the system knows that these can run independently. Uh, in fact, um, all purely functional operations will be parallelized. That doesn't mean they actually run at the same time. You are, maybe you only have a few calls to do that job, 
uh, but the system knows that it in principle it could do that. Uh, that would also be the case if you added more operators for, say, GPU support or uh, doing uh, uh, jobs on uh, remote machines. Uh, uh, it, it, it's very easy to add uh, uh, new uh, operators to the framework. You just need to specify uh, what are the inputs, uh, do you read from those, do you write to those, what kinds of values do you produce. It's usually just a few lines of code. And um, uh, then you just need to give me a function to call to start your operation and I'll give you a call back that tells me that you're done uh, and that's it. So it will keep track of all the uh, dependencies, whether you're reading, writing, etc. Uh, the system is also a resource aware. Uh, so the way it works is um, unlike uh, TensorFlow or some other uh, uh, frameworks that allow for parallelization, uh, you don't have to specify the complete computational graph. Uh, you start computing uh, or, or your user thread starts executing operations that will immediately run at the same time while you're still growing the computational graph, so to speak. And your computational resources, thread pools, GPUs, whatever you might have in there, they're just trying to catch up with that user threads. Uh, so they are re reducing behind you. And one problem there might be that uh, you run out of computational resources. So uh, maybe uh, your computations are very expensive and your user thread is just too fast growing the computational graph. Uh, so eventually you might run out of resources or maybe you overcommit to GPUs or network nodes. Uh, so the framework knows that there are resource limitations and will simply block your th uh, user thread or user threads. You can also use several uh, if uh, it uh, sees that uh, some resource uh, is, uh, has reached its bounds. Um, the, you can also, sub, uh, it also supports parallel writes to the same impure value. Um, and then th th that's actually the only case where the user has to uh, uh, add extra uh, code to make this happen. Uh, so everything else is completely uh, uh, parallelized, but in that particular case, uh, it's, a, it's more difficult. So we create a vector with 20 elements and copy the first 10 elements of A to Y and another 10 elements from vector B uh, to the offset 11 in Y. So obviously these two regions don't overlap. So they could happen in parallel, but there's no good way for, for the, the framework to know that this, is, uh, that this can be safely done. Uh, you might have some really fancy operators that access this object uh, in the uh, or, or elements uh, in the vector or matrix in a way that I cannot possibly tell overlap with something else. So if you want to be able to do that, uh, there are fork and join operators to do that. And uh, interestingly, that is also important for reverse modes, algorithmic differentiation, uh, even if you have purely functional programs. So that's actually interesting. Um, let's say you copy, uh, uh, you, you make two copies of a vector, but these copies don't overlap. While you're just evaluating that function, the system would immediately see, okay, this is just reads uh, operations, uh, I can uh, parallelize that. But the reverse mode just turns all of the, the arrows around, so to speak, so the reads become writes. And uh, if you want to be able to uh, also have reverse mode run in parallel, you might actually still have to add uh, these annotations, so that's, uh, uh, you can do that. Um, I also wanted to be able to avoid um, repeated functional evaluations. Uh, if you generate a computational trace, uh, uh, so what I've seen in some frameworks, uh, you can calculate um, derivatives in reverse mode, but then you have to call the function again uh, and generate another trace. Uh, that's not necessary, so the, the trace is, uh, or the computational graph is completely abstract. It knows nothing about algorithmic differentiation or parallelization or anything. Uh, you can substitute, substitute all kinds of functionality into it, like visualization of graphs, etc. And um, uh, these uh, uh, graphs also keep all the values they observed around. So if you want to um, uh, repeatedly evaluate a function, you could uh, speed up uh, the system quite noticeably. And uh, this also transforms your program to mostly in-place operations. So even, even, if, even, even if you write a, com uh, a program that is pure, purely functional, uh, the transformed uh, program uh, 
uh, needs to be able to uh, perform imperative operations because if you keep those values around to reuse them, uh, you cannot generate new ones. You have to write into those uh, to, to, to make that happen. Uh, and one of the last things to mention, yeah, it does not blow your stack. It, it, interestingly, is, uh, lots of frameworks of strange limitations where you do something that's completely normal and frequent to do in when you write a, a, a standard a program in the standard algebra, so to speak. And if you try to uh, calculate the derivatives, suddenly you run out of stack space or uh, run into other kinds of limitations that uh, shouldn't be there. So the, the goal was the behavior of the system should be as close as possible uh, to what you, you would expect from the standard algebra. It should behave uh, the same at least operationally. Uh, that's not always quite possible. So obviously with reverse mode you have to keep much more, mem uh, much more memory around. Uh, or also with parallelism, uh, there's a larger computational graph behind you, but uh, you, you can you usually have some idea uh, whether that's possible on your machine or in the case of the parallelism framework, you can uh, set resource limits uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, prevent uh, behavior that uh, would be unexpected. Yeah, and so, uh, obviously the final point uh, that since I've demonstrated this before, you can visualize computational graphs, which is very useful, especially for debugging things like reverse mode rules. So it's, it's, it's quite tricky to get some of those uh, right, especially if you have things like uh, doing in-place operations. Yeah? You calculate the sign of a vector, but you store that result in the vector itself. Uh, so if you want to make sure that uh, all these are different cases are uh, handled correctly, you probably want to look at computational graphs and uh, to, to verify um, the correctness of your transformations. Okay, uh, we have three minutes left for Q&A. Uh, Hi, over here on your left. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> so I got a couple of questions. So I wrote them down so I wouldn't forget. <clears throat> um, is it fair to say that when you're doing this backward mode AD, the first step is to extract the computational graph and the second step is to then differentiate it? Is that right? Yeah, it so can be decomposed into two steps. Right. Yeah. So uh, you provide this functor in which I instantiate an algebra that uh, uh, does a lot of bookkeeping behind the scenes. So the, your user your code knows nothing what the algebra is doing. Right. And the, you obtain a computational trace that uh, then you can use to uh, do all kinds of things. So it's not specialized for reverse mode, but there's a particular so-called tracer algebra that you can then uh, just run backwards, so to speak, and you get uh, an intended result. And so from an, an API perspective, yeah. the user of your library just has to open that module Right. Even if he's doing float to float kind of calculations, he's got to open special plus and minus operators. Right. So they just need to wrap the codes into that functor, open the, the functor argument, and uh, I mean, the API is a little different from the standards uh, uh, from the uh, pervasives library in OCaml. So I packaged it up a little more neatly with floats operations in a sub module and vectors for double precision numbers, etc. So uh, the name is a little different from what people usually expect, but. Uh, Hopefully better. <laughs> and, and, and if, if were you doing just simple float operations, but we happen to be calling one function that's like external FFI, that's float to float. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if, if, you, if you have some uh, new function for which you need a derivative, obviously I can't inspect the external code. But if you know the mathematical properties, and um, for example, some external function might be huge, like uh, matrix factorization. Uh, if you know the mathematical properties, it's actually quite tr easy to uh, implement the correct rules for reverse mode or also forward mode and add this to the system. So that's why I, uh, I thought that extensibility was very important. Okay. L last question. Yeah. If you have like calculations which, you know, uh, where the output is basically a float, but somewhere d deep down you have matrices. Are you able to compose the float mode and the matrix mode so that it's kind of seamless? Or oh, it's completely there, seamless. Yeah. Uh, so I, actually, on the, in the first example, um, uh, uh, so that's actually what's happening here. We uh, have right. this uh, GMM function that performs matrix m uh, multiplications, and uh, at the very bottom we have the SSQR diff, which just computes the uh, sum of squared differences uh, between these two matrices. 
and that's uh, the result. So you can, of course, also have several outputs or several, uh, uh, for your function, uh, but in that case, reverse mode may not be the right choice depending on your problem. Great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. First question um, you mentioned taking like derivatives of imperative code. What yeah. is like the derivative of? Um, like resetting a mutable cell or like basically how mm -hmm. do you assign the semantics to yeah. So the, in, in forward mode it's obviously trivial. Uh, if you write to a vector you also have the derivative vector and you just uh, write the derivative of that float into the derivative vector. For reverse mode it's a little bit more tricky or I mean not, not that's uh, complex either. Uh, if you write uh, overwrite a value any value that wasn't there before uh, will not have an influence on the result because you overwrote it. It's, it's, the chain is broken in that case, but not in a bad way. So uh, uh, all the um, uh, it, information bubbling up from the bottom about derivatives or joint values will go through this one set operation and be propagated uh, to the top. Okay. And the other thing is, have you ever thought of like renaming this library since it seems to be useful for so many other like mm -hmm. things besides automatic differentiation. Uh, so since it also supports parallelism and visualization, uh, it would certainly be feasible to break apart the library and uh, make a standalone library maybe for uh, parallelization. Uh, I, I think it's a good idea to keep it somewhat together because uh, um, uh, that way it's guaranteed if somebody writes a code that uh, parallelizes, uh, then they can also apply it uh, uh, to uh, apply algorithmic differentiation to that uh, problem. One more question. Mm -hmm. uh, in your forward mode example, you showed that the yeah. derivative was just a single float, and you mentioned to do multiple inputs, you'd have to recompute. Mm -hmm. Lots of other frameworks just have a derivative that's the whole vector of all the partial derivatives with respect to each input. Do you have an algebra for that? Uh, so, so, so you mean if, if there's several? Uh, yeah, so you, you yeah. could just have your derivative be a vector yeah. of the, all the partial derivatives with respect to each of your inputs and thereby yeah. compute with respect to all inputs in parallel and forward mode. Oh, I think what you mean is, so, so one thing you can do is you can specify uh, different directions simultaneously so you don't have to reevaluate that same code many times to obtain every, each individual uh, derivative uh, for the inputs in forward mode. Uh, so each direction, so to speak, yeah, would, have, would, for example, start as 1, 0, 0, 0, etc. And the uh, next direction would be 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. So you basically just pass along the identity matrix in some abstract way to enter. Uh, I mean, it's still inefficient uh, to do it that way uh, because uh, if you have n variables, you have to pass along n directions. Uh, so it, it would still be n squared in the number of parameters in terms of computation time. Um, but it, 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 the system can do that, yeah. Thanks. <laughs>